I grew up in, uh, on the Monterey Peninsula area and uh, went for two years uh, to uh, Monterey Peninsula College. This was in the early 70s. So we had the Monterey Independent Film Festival and I got on the committee uh, that year. I was 19 years old. But the high point of the festival was going to be this wonderful uh, wizard of a filmmaker, you know, called James Broughton, was going to come down all the way from San Francisco and debut, premiere his latest work, Dreamwood. This was a big deal, you know, and we were all very excited. And there was a special night set off, off just for James. And so the big night came, and in literally swept James with his flowing white hair and, uh, you know, his, I don't know if he had an entourage, but it kind of felt like he did, you know. And he was just, the place was this gorgeous theater on campus. They're in Monterey in 1970, autumn of 1972. And there was this little uh, gay boy, me, wanting to come out. Now, I was out to myself, I had a gay brother, and we were close growing up. And we often talked about being gay and different, so uh, I, I felt pretty out, but you know, in Monterey, uh, there were, we hadn't heard about Stone, the Stonewall Riots. I mean, how would you know about it? You know, it wasn't written about or, you know, but anyway, it was a joyous night. James came, showed the film, read the poems, had the audience in the palm of his hand. It was a lovely evening, and I was sat in the back row watching the film and sit, hearing this extraordinary man read his poetry. And all of a sudden, you know, light bulbs begin, and bells and whistles begin to go off. And I went, oh my God, this person is really speaking to me. I, I would like to be like him. Wow, you know, I've never seen anybody like this. And he was really out in all ways. So finally the program ends and I hop up, you know, from my seat and run to my cheese and wine station, because that was my next assignment. And the doors bang open and, you know, dozens of people storm into this lobby and the place is packed and you know, I'm passing out the wine and the cheese and the crackers, you know, for the reception. Uh, and she was shy, though. And uh, the reception just kept on going on and on and on. And people were so excited. And suddenly I looked up because I had this unnerving feeling that someone was really looking at me. And I looked up and across this, it was a long, narrow lobby, of course. On the other end, there was James holding court, you know, being surrounded by these well-wishers. And he, all of a sudden I could tell him, he was just looking at me from all across the room. And then suddenly, kind of like a wave of his hand, he just started coming right at me across the room. And the crowd parted, kind of like the, <laughs> the, the Red Sea or something. It was really kind of a magical moment. And I'm just standing there going, Oh my God, he's coming to me. You know, what have, I, what have I done? And he comes up and he stops right in front of me. And the room kind of is a little quiet. And he looks at me right in the eyes. And then he takes his hands on both of my cheeks and lifts up my head like this. And I'm looking up at him. And he looks down at me and he says, don't worry young man. Everything will be all right. And then he bent down and kissed me on the cheek. And then he giggled. How did you respond? And he turned and walked back and the party resumed. Well, it was like lightning had struck me. And years later I have interpreted that moment. How is spiritual knowledge, how is the divine? transferred from knowledge about being yourself, about being your authentic self, that it is okay. How is that transmitted? It's, you know, it's a spiritual transmission. And that's what happened to me. S something was imparted 
in me, in my core, by that simple act, generous act of kindness, because James saw me. We really, in the way that my parents couldn't see me or anyone else in a sleepy little town. Well, he was flamboyant as hell. Are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, I knew right away. I mean, this was like a big, I don't want to say queen, but he was a flamboyant, uh, I didn't, I read him as a flamboyant gay man, you know? Certainly a, a, a great artist, but very uninhibited and, you know, come on. <laughs> what more can I say? Have you found yourself doing this kind of imparting to other, to younger men? I have now, but not in the James way. I mean, only James could do it that way. Yes, but every opportunity that I have to impart to questioning or doubting or sad young men as I was at that time, to say, lighten up, love yourself, allow love to come in, to trickle in into your soul and to know that you uh, are capable. Say, I wouldn't even know what love was. That you are capable of being loved just as you are. What an important life-changing uh, lesson. That moment changed my life. I mean, not in a dramatic way. It just isn't like I leapt out of bed the next morning with scarves and tambourines or anything. But uh, something had shifted. Now I can be me, really the me that uh, this uh, stupendous man who told me really who I was. Before I left, I went to the one bookstore, the kind of the liberal bookstore, and I found this little book called The Gay Insider. And it was a listing of all the, it was an early gay lib book uh, by John, Paul Hudson, I think, somebody like that. And it was just a listing of all the gay bars and places that one could go. And um, the back cover, I remember, had all been taped over with black masking tape. So it was a censored book. But it was still called, I could read on the spine. And so I looked, I, 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 I uh, actually, I think I snatched the book because I was too uh, embarrassed to buy it or something. So I had it in my luggage, and that's the first thing I looked at, and I went down the listing of all the places, because I had to get laid. I, tell you, I hadn't had sex with anybody. And uh, so I finally came to a place called The Stud, and there was a little description, and it's, you know, redwood panels. I went, oh, well, okay, I come from a place that has redwood trees. That sounds like a fit. So I got my little Toyota and go to The Stud, and Within an hour, I, I meet a sailor, a merchant marine, who took me home and tied me up and gave me poppers, which I thought, well, this is coming out with a bang. And uh, I got up the next morning and got ready for school. And I'm late, and I'm running around this corner, you know, in, the, in this little tiny campus to get to the screening room. And who should I bump into but James? And I just had a little jaunty beret on. And I'm all wet. And I look up again, and he says, oh, hello, young man. He didn't know my name. He said, oh, hello, young man. I thought we'd meet again. And that was it. And from that night on, we uh, became friends. My favorite film today remains Dreamwood, out of all of James's um, extensive canon of films, but I think I say that because it was the first of James's films that I saw. I mean, that was the film that was being premiered that night in Monterey. But I actually, I love the film. It's a very complex uh, allegory about um, uh, a man's path to um, not only finding himself, but, uh, you know, uniting the uh, you might, some people say, the yin and the yang, the feminine with the masculine, you know, into uh, psychological wholeness. That is really the allegory of that film, and that's 
uh, a theme that I certainly have worked on in my own life, and I believe that that is one of the central tasks for all men, whether you be a gay or straight man, to integrate uh, what the Jungians would call the anima and the animus. Also, it was a very strikingly beautiful film, and I think out of all of James's films, perhaps his most uh, professionally polished. It was really quite a production, beautifully photographed. Well, the uh, final scene of Dreamwood, where after the protagonist, who's this really hunky, usually naked guy, you know, and he has to get in a boat and go over the, over the water, you know, that's central to mythology. Um, so the whole film is just filled with one archetypal image or situation after another, culminating with him uh, literally fucking the earth. And so that's a hard image to, <laughs> but yeah, that's an unforgettable image. But uh, that was, but in this, what it meant symbolically was um, the unification that he was, that was, you know, the night journey of the soul. Oh, everybody remembers The Bed. I mean, that was, of course, The Bed was James Broughton's most popular film. It played the nation, uh, all the midnight movie circuit, uh, students, I mean, everybody loved that film. What was not to love about it? You know, uh, the film opens with this enormous, well, not enormous, but big brass bed with this lively, you know, music, you know. But it was a really jaunty, dum da dum da dum da dum you know, kind of music, and all of a sudden over this hill you see this big empty brass bed uh, just kind of magically, apparently, moving by itself, you know, over hill and dell. And I, you know, it was a, quite a striking image, and years later, just over uh, dinner, I said, now, James, how did you guys do that? And he said, well, we uh, dug little troughs in the earth. I mean, this is all grassy hills of Marin, right? So you couldn't see the little troughs. And then we had ropes and pulleys, and we would actually would tug the bed, which was on little rollers. So, you know, you couldn't see the ropes or anything. So the bed seemed to be just magically going over these tawny, golden, grassy hills of, Mar of Marin until finally it finds its right spot and it twirls around. And then there's a succession of all different kinds of people, you know. And the theme of the film was, what do you do in the bed? All the different things that we do in bed. You know, it's a bed is where we pray. Uh, a bed is where we are betrayed, you know. <laughs> Something like, I'll have to go back and, but, um, and it had some very famous characters. Alan Watts was in the film and Ralph Gleason and I think, uh, uh, Imogene Cunningham, all these local celebrities. Anna Halprin was a wonderful uh, dancer. They, I th believe they were all in the film, or most of the people that I've mentioned. So it was a beautiful, joyous, gusty embrace of human diversity and human sexuality, you know. And um, there was a lot of uh, naked flesh. So this was the 60s. What was not to like, you know, it was a very positive, uh, joyful film. Enormously popular. Um, it was okay for me, but it really wasn't my favorite film. I uh, really have always very much appreciated The Pleasure Garden, which uh, I think he made in the 50s in a deserted uh, garden outside of London and it was made in black and white. I'm a real fan of black and white uh, imagery. And uh, I believe that was the film that got the special award from uh, the Cannes Film Festival that year. And Jean Carteau gave James the special award and he presented the award with a kiss. So there's kind of like a lineage here, right? Of a kiss. How do you mean? Well, I mean, something being imparted, you know, a blessing or, yeah, you know, for, 
fr from one old queer to another. <laughs> well, James wasn't an old queer then, he was a young one. Well, I think it's a vast and, and much undervalued and un, almost unknown, which is uh, sad. Of course, he came out of um, the post-World War II cultural explosion that was happening in the Bay Area. Well, James technically was never a, a beat poet or part of the beat scene. I mean, he actually was a precursor, I believe, to the beats. You know, but James was a major uh, had always been a major uh, creative force once he decided that that's what he wanted to do. I mean, he was a playwright and he uh, had a little publishing uh, house with his friend Kermit Sheet. Uh, of course, very much into the film, his early films, the Looney Tom films, I believe Pauline Kael, whom he was having a, a close, intimate uh, relationship. I'm not privy to what exactly, but they did have a daughter together, a little known fact. This is an aside, I mean, this is leaping forward, what, 30 years, so there, I think, somewhere in the, what was it, the late 70s, you know, every uh, November, James would have a birthday celebration at the Cinematheque that would show a, a selection of his films, you know, followed by a little reception. So there, there we all were again. And uh, we were at the reception point, and Harry Hay uh, had come with John Burnside. And Harry and, uh, and uh, James had been, um, I can't say boyfriends, but I think they dated for a while. James later told me that he really didn't uh, care for Harry all that much. He thought he was a little overbearing and just wasn't his type. But, you know, th they did a little court and spark at Stanford in the early 30s. So this birthday occasion must have been around 82 or 83, maybe something like that. Anyway, in walks Pauline Kael, and by then the dish had come out that, of course, Harry and uh, James had been, uh, you know, an item, you know, back way back in the early 30s at Stanford, where they were both uh, undergraduates, and then in walks scale with which, with whom James had had this affair, you know, 20 years later in the 50s. My, what a busy man. It was actually 48. Was it 48? Yep. It up. Yeah, okay. And um, so in comes Cal, you know, all smoke and fire, and she goes, and we're all like just talking, you know, a little circle, and he walks, she walks right up and says, well, Hello, James, I'm here. And without, like, wasting a beat, Harry turns to Pauline Kale and says, Oh, well, I've always wanted to meet you. Now, who was the mother and who was the father? Well, we were stunned. I mean, you could just imagine James hoping that a hole would open up and you'd felt couldn't disappear. You could hear a pin drop. It was this kind of this collective like <sighs> intake of breath, you know, like, oh my God, Harry, you just didn't say that, did you? And Kale didn't say a word. She just glowered at all of us like furious, turned and stomped off in the other direction. I don't think we ever saw her again that night. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, that was the evening that James was re-screening um, the Pleasure Garden again. And so once again, I got to appreciate uh, really what a fine piece of uh, uh, avant-garde cinema it is. Uh, I think James was one of the pioneers of, of avant-garde cinema, certainly on the West Coast, you know. Um, and what there was, I'm not an expert in this film, but I think there's Maya Darren was working and uh, a few others. But I mean, he really um, was among the first of his time to pick up a camera and start making films. You know, these the first little films that then later became more extravagant. And uh, but he started right after the war. I mean, he made films throughout. A lifetime. So, what his first films were made in the late 40s, 
mid 40s. Yes, uh, one of the last films that James ever made, um, Scattered Remains, where I believe that's the one where he's in the rocking chair by the edge of the sea and he's asking the ocean, you know, as it's the waves are, you know, uh, overlapping on his feet and he's rocking back and forth and he's asking the sea how deep how, how deep are you? And the sea responds, well, that depends upon how deep you want to go. And I love that question, and I love that answer. And the image of him just contemplating the depths in this white, grand white rocking chair, it, to me, is just a, a completely memorable image. And I've never seen anything like it, not even in big budget Hollywood uh, st studio films. Uh, there are a few images that have, have really grasped me so much. Always, ever, and only. When the right thing comes along from two directions and runs into itself in some improbable place, the, co the collision can shatter mere dreams of affection with the head-on reality of a bang-up embrace. Love is always that life is made of. Love is always hope of love. Though fancy may toy with a reckless pursuit of dazzling encounters in faraway weather, there is no delight elsewhere that can substitute for the everyday squeeze of here and together. Love is the ever that life is made of. Love is ever home of love. From summer to summer with king-size caress, renewals grow sweeter than beds of whipped cream. So reaffirm firmly what began with a yes and praise the right thing that improved on the dream. Love is the only that life is made of. Love is the only cure for love. It's a beautiful poem. His poems are, again, I think part of James's, um, it's not his dilemma, it's actually the dilemma of the world, because James always existed beyond categories. He did not want to be categorized strictly as a poet or as a filmmaker. I mean, he was making his books and his films, you know, congruently. One process would inform the other. And he took both, you know, totally seriously. Uh, but he just had this very unique uh, point of, uh, of view and of expressing himself. And I said, uh, you know, I'm not an either or kind of guy. I'm a both and. That was the, one of the other things that I really learned from James is how to be a both-and person, rather than an either-or. And I've applied that lesson uh, to my own life through all aspects of my life, through my intellectual pursuits, through um, my uh, psychology, my own process of uh, soul healing that I've had to do, uh, through my uh, genders, I'm one of those people that believe that we're, we, we are, particularly we gay men, are of several genders. And again, it's, it's not uh, making a choice of either or, but both and. And it is because of this that I think that uh, James has somewhat fallen between the cracks, because we live in an either or kind of world. And it still has a great difficulties in accepting uh, you know, this, uh, the two becoming one, which was a great theme in all of James's work, both his poetry and his cinema. Well, I saw him, and, you know, some things don't need to be uh, spoken about. You just get your ass out of the chair and you do the work. <laughs> so, you know, James did the work. I mean, he was a dedicated artist, you know, and he wasn't one of these 
oh boo hoo hoo, you know, I have to suffer to make my art, you know. There was always a, you know, there's always a little bit of, of that, you know. But he got up and did it, you know, he did the, he did the work. Well, he was working, you know. He always had a, a work room, you know, it was always filled with papers and, you know, bits of film and canisters of, of film and maybe a, a moviola, um, boxes of, 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 you know, published works that the publisher had sent. But I remember one thing, above it all, wherever he, they moved, he and Joel would move, he had this, uh, like, little banner or sign that was calligraphed. And it said, when in doubt, cut. And that was the, <laughs> simple as it is, that's the other great kind of lesson in making art or making life. When in doubt, cut. And so, you know, he was a very disciplined uh, artist. And when in doubt, cut. Go to the next, <laughs> go to the next thing. You Have know. you followed that in your own writing? I've tried to. That's what, you know, among other things, I was telling you that's why my new little memoir is, is short. Because I thought, when in doubt, cut. I mean, that always, I wish I had practiced that more with some of my relationships. Because because when I didn't follow that is when I got into trouble. Did you ever see James angry or frustrated? Oh yes, yes, of course. What made him angry? What what made James Broughton angry? Uh, other people's stupidity. Uh, not that he was. Uh, some people might thought he was a bit of a diva, but what poet isn't? You know, he would. But. Uh, James was very much in the uh, tradition, the bardic tradition, you know. He believed that poetry was meant to be uh, spoken or declaimed, you know, that it was a, to be a, a public act or a public celebration, not just something to be, you know, read on, on the page, you know. He was very much into, well, uh, the, the, the name of uh, this film, Big Joy, you know, Again, the spiritual transmission. How is the life of anything to be conveyed but through personal experience? Um, so when he wasn't making a work of art, he was planning on, well, what is going to be the next reading or the next screening? And he always made it fun, like, it, you know, it was a celebration, a party. Come on in, the water's fine. You know, let's let's be together and and do this together. What was James's central message? Uh, love, be loved, uh, find joy. You know, it really uh, authentic. Be true to yourself. I mean, these are very simple. They almost sound like cliches, but you know, they're harder to achieve than you'd think, you know, in a world of phonies, you know, or people who are wearing masks or personas, you know, all the time. James's great uh, act of uh, devotion in life was to uh, shred through those, first, of course, in his own being. James was a complicated man, you know. But, you know, uh, that's also what made him a complex, fascinating artist, you know. But he was always, it was, um, I think James's great statement as an artist was that he was always in dressing. I know he was very fond of William Blake, and we often talked about the importance of Walt Whitman, particularly as a gay Poet, and, and you know James wasn't waving a gay lib flag or gay banner. He didn't need to do any of that. I mean, he was embodied. He embodied it. He was living it. You know, why hoist a flag when you're already there? Well, about now James's uh, long friendship with Alan Watts. I don't know. I never met Alan Watts. I have one of his books here, which was very helpful to me, 
So when he told me about um, the parties that he attended uh, with Alan Watts, I guess there was a big house that uh, I think Watts lived up in up on Mount Tam, and sometimes the party would uh, go in a sexual direction, and um, maybe it was just a British schoolboy thing, you know, where Mr. Watts liked to be. Uh, whacked on the bum a bit or something. And James, you know, was a little uncomfortable with that, you know. Uh, and I think that came up in our conversation because later, uh, like in their late 70s and early 80s, I began to very quite seriously explore the uh, leather scene in San Francisco. I wouldn't say I was a leather queen. I imagine clomp around in black leather. But I mean, it was so available. And it was, you know, part of the sexual revolution. and. Uh, I liked a lot of the men. A lot of the guys in that scene happened to uh, were artists, too, a little known fact. And so I had uh, artist friends that were, you know, gay bikers. And I really liked them. And sometimes they'd give me rides on the back of their bikes. And uh, so I, you know, I began just to, to explore all of that. And, you know, first he had some like, Mark, be careful. You know, that can be kind of rough. And then he, he kind of giggled and he said, well, I do remember that, that night when I was with Alan Watts. And I said, well, I think that was a little different or I don't know. So we didn't go there much. But finally he said, no, that's OK. Because he said, you know, aside from following your bliss kind of thing, which was more of really Robert Bly's statement, which has now become a complete cliche, um, but true, as most cliches are. But James would always say, follow your weird. And I said, well, this is pretty weird stuff, some of this. And he said, that's OK. Just keep your head on, on straight. And you know, if anything really ever bad happens, you know, let, let, let me know. And I said, oh, OK. But I mean, he was good friends with Palmer. I mean, he was no stranger. I mean, he didn't uh, travel in those schools himself, but I mean, you know, San Francisco is just a tiny little city, really. It's only seven square miles, and, you know, the poetry scene there, I mean, many of the poets, like his very good friend Paul Mariah, was very well-known participant in the, in the leather scene there. And, of course, an absolutely seminal figure in his time. He published James and uh, in the early Man Root publications, and, you know, he was always in leather, and every time I would bump into Paul on a street corner. He was, always had clutching reams of manuscripts going off to a reading or something. Again, he was uh, like James, uh, always uh, busy, you know. Not as a self-promoter in the sense that we would think of some slick Hollywood guy, you know, promoting something, but wanting to get on with it, you know, to create an audience, to have the audience uh, hear, hear the work, you know, and if you don't do it yourself, who's going to do it? So there I'd often bump into Paul, and we were very friendly, and, but uh, he always reeked of Crisco. So I knew where Paul had been the, the, the previous night, right? <laughs> what was James's role in connecting sex with spirit? Well, uh, he was just saying that the two are inextricably intertwined. And again, it's not an either or, you know, it's a dance, it's a dance of the so-called opposites as one into unity. And that you really can't authentically and honestly talk about one without talking about the other, you know. And I think that's where the spiritual scene, you know, is filled with so many phonies because they're all airborne and they're disconnected with their bodies and their sexuality or they're denying it or they're pushing it or repressing it somewhere. And conversely, uh, certainly the wide open, balls out, you know, sexual 
flesh pot scene of San Francisco then that was all over the city. So many of those people were disconnected from their spirituality. So they ended up in very dark, you know, places, you know, that frankly was a little scary. And I, I saw uh, and witnessed both ends of that. So uh, James was really saying the whole point of the game is to be honest and authentic and one uh, doesn't form the other. We never uh, had sex. Um, you know, I guess technically, obviously, you know, after a marriage and three children, one out of wedlock, um, you would say he was a bisexual. But I don't know, again, these are categories. And James was always saying, we've got, let's get out of the categories. Let's get out of these man-made, uh, these are constructions. It's not really how we live. I've had sexual experiences with a few women, you know, delightful experiences, but I wouldn't consider myself a bisexual man. I mean, I'm a, uh, an authentically gay man, but it was in the spirit of experimentation or, in, in my case, just out of love, you know. But it isn't like I was doing that to try to be, see if I could become heterosexual. I mean, I've known I've been gay since I was five or six years old. I mean, we didn't have that word then, but I, my, my brother and I certainly knew that we were other, different, you know, something beyond the, the gender arrangement of the, of the time. So I think James Broughton was unique because uh, he was just James. Other than, well, I think James had a delightful role, particularly later in his life, as like, he took great delight in sort of like rallying on the boys. I mean, obviously he had a, a very appreciative eye for male beauty, you know. Uh, but beyond that, uh, he was a great uh, believer in kind of a spree de corps, you might say, and let's, you know, uh, just he was wanting, particularly the my generation of gay men, because I came out, you know, uh, as I just explained in the uh, early 70s, right after the Stonewall. I was, uh, let's see, in 69, when the Stonewall riots happened, I was a junior in, at Carmel High School. I wasn't even at high school. And of course, we didn't hear about, I didn't hear about Stonewall until uh, years later, because it wasn't, you know, on the front page of the Monterey Peninsula Herald. And where were we supposed to, you know, learn that, find this out? Well, I did find it out later. But uh, as a member of the, you might say, the gay, boom, the gay boomers, I say I'm a gay boomer, of that very critical swing generation that quickly, if we didn't already live in San Francisco, we quickly moved there and, began, and inhabited it. So the city itself was just this big, throbbing, gay, uh, you know, experiment. And there were gay people everywhere. And I think uh, at that point, uh, James was in heaven because there were all of these creative, smart, interesting, handsome, sexual, sexualized, you know, gay men, you know, going around with their hearts and their hard-ons, you know, working together. And I think that impressed James a lot. And uh, even though he was, you know, uh, getting older, I think he was in his 60s or 70s by then, um, he loved, you know, being with, the, being with us. Well, I don't think he wanted to go there. You know, I've never seen anybody who more fully embraced life and all of its possibilities you know, that great line, was it, um, uh, adventure, you know, not predicament. You know, life is full of possibilities, so why, why close the door, you know? Why become a junkie? Why become depressed? Why end up in a dead-end relationship? Why contemplate suicide, even though he, that's something he did, apparently, early in his life? But, I mean, he knew that one. So why do these things? 
when there's life to be fully embraced and explored and celebrated. So, no, I don't think death was an easy thing for him. But what was even more difficult for James was right towards the end of his life, of course, he had a series uh, of what, the minor strokes, I believe, uh, up there in Port Townsend. And, and he wrote a series of poems, which I find among his most touching, what I just call the, the, the decrepitude poems, where he's talking about affirmities and the body failing, you know, not being the body, not being able to do what he wanted it to, of age itself, you know, coming. And once he got through that struggle, I feel that, uh, again, James became a wonderful role model for me. Because once he got through that struggle, then he shifted and he embraced death and went sailing into death with uh, so much, I don't want to use the word enthusiasm, that would be the wrong word, but with verve and gusto, you know, and deep understanding of the potentialities of death itself, which of course he was wise enough and spiritually deep enough at that point to realize that it wasn't just an end game, that it's a transformation to another state of being. So once the shift came, he embraced the, I believe, from my point of view, he embraced death. And again, it was a great lesson. Don't be afraid of it. Don't deny it. It's going to happen to all of us. So do right by it. Well, James used the expression big joy, not only as a uh, uh, you know, like a, a self-description. Uh, but it was his credo, you know, for life. You know, big joy. He, he saw life as, uh, as a wondrous adventure and the earth as, the, uh, as a great stage to cultivate that wonder and pleasure, you know. You know, that other great line of his, allness, uh, ripeness is all, you know. Ripe. Or allness is ripe, right. I'm, uh, allness is ripe. And uh, you know, some of his lines, uh, or his thoughts, like, again, I'm just paraphrasing, but he said, imagine in a world where volcanoes and toucan birds could exist at the same point. I said, you know, uh, who, who thought that one up? You know? What, what a magical, splendid uh, world. It's not all about suffering and misery. I mean, certainly James uh, had enough encounter with suffering and misery, but at some point I think he said, well, I've had enough of that. I've learned what I need to, to learn from that. Now let's you know, find a way you know, alchemically to transform that lead into gold, and the gold was big joy. Well, okay, I'll just read the P.S. <laughs> I like this. P.S. from Big Joy. Brill Brillo, your soul. Windex, your spirit. Here comes lucidity. A blithe spirit brings a lark into any bored room. Relish everything and keep nothing. Pack up everything and take it to the dump. Never let go of abandon. Applaud every flabbergast. The worst is still to come, the best is yet to be. And you see what James is saying there. Get, get, get rid of the luggage. Get the hell out of, your, out of your way. And drop the pretense, you know, drop the, uh, the false modesty. Just drop the luggage and uh, see yourself. And again, just going back to that lesson that he imparted to me when I was 20, uh, find the capacity to be loved as you are and then to return that love. It was all just about that cycle of 
love and being loved. You see, in my uh, life experiences, I can't tell you the number of times and the number of people that I've encountered um, who don't feel they're worthy of love or are capable of love. And it's very painful to be around people like that for me now. You know, and that's it. I mean, life is very short. This is it, number one. Oh, I, everyone loves this poem, of course. All right. <clears throat> I still have this poem in my study and on a little card. He and Joel uh, printed it like on a little, very nice paper, and it was like a em embossed, uh, you know, like a note card. And I keep it uh, on the same door where I keep all of my AIDS medic medications. And you know, that old thing, never explain, never complain, never whine. So, you know, I still have to take a lot of medicine every day. So I keep this poem uh, next to these medicines, which sometimes um, aren't so pleasant. And so, but I always read the poem and it gets me through because this is it. And I am it. And you are it. And so is that. And he is it, and she is it, and it is it, and that is that. Oh, it is this, and it is thus, and it is them, and it is us. And it is now, and here it is, and here we are. So, this is it. James Broughton was a big sissy, uh, a gadfly. James Broughton was a marvelous host. James Broughton was a giggle and a gaggle of g giggles. <laughs> Follow your weird. <laughs>